Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So again, another continuation of the review series, and this is going to be a plant from a species that a lot of people keep asking me that they want to see more reviews of, so I do hear you all, and we are going to be talking about a Hoya today, or otherwise known, I think, as wax plants. The one specifically that I'm going to be talking about today is the Hoya carii, or the Sweetheart Vine, or the Sweetheart Hoya, and you'll understand when you see it in just a moment. A lot of you probably have already seen this plant in one form or another. But before we get into it, as always, let's set some ground rules. So obviously for the people that are returning, welcome back. You know the deal by this point. You can find a, your favorite chapter down below and just skip to that if you wanted to. If you're new, the ground rules are as follows. There is very little that I can do to make these reviews unbiased. I just won't. Basically, this is my review on my plants in my environment. And if you're just new and joining now, I'm based in the UK, I'm growing most of my plants in a conservatory in the UK, and whatever that might mean in both the winter and the summer in terms of humidity, light, heat, all of the above. So this is just going to be my experience with the plant. As always with all of these reviews, I do encourage you, if you do own this plant, and you'd want to share your own experiences with it, please do so down below. This is the whole point of these videos, is that they are a repository essentially of information that people can look at and see what others' experiences has been with a specific plant before they maybe are purchasing it, or as I'm finding out from a lot of you, around the time of purchase or just after purchase, but you know. But right, let's dive into the first topic. So background with my specific plants, and I've got two that I want to share with you today. I do also have for the eagle-eyed, before I kind of dive into anything else, for the eagle-eyed, both of these are Hoyocarii's and they're both variegated. I don't think there's another form of Hoyocarii variegata. I think it's mainly this, where it's the, the margins are variegated. Correct me, I have got a very niggling suspicion that there might be another form of variegation, but I have got the one where the variegation is on the margins of the leaves, so that means on the outside of the leaves. I'm trying to think if it ever does flip in the other way. No, I think it's normally on the outside of the leaves for mine. I do have the green one. I'll see if I can insert a picture somewhere. The reason why I haven't got that here in front of me, barring the fact that these are very, very heavy plants, that one is also in a very, very awkward place, so I can just add some pictures in, but essentially just imagine the leaf being fully green. There's no real difference between the two types of plants. I might talk a bit more about how they differ from the variegated to the non-variegated form in terms of maybe speed of growth, but as a whole, they're pretty much the same plant. But yes, so the background on these, and I might have to put one of these down very soon because they are heavy. They are very, very heavy plants. So this was my first plant, and hopefully the video will have how old this plant is. If I'm not mistaken, it's either three or four years old. You would maybe expect it to be a bit larger. You can also see that there are vines that I've wrapped. I mean, for the people that have been here for a while, uh, <laughs> support sticks for the win with these ones. <laughs> the support sticks are doing the mostest with both of these plants. So I've had learnings from one and the other, so that's why you can see this one is curled around, and this one is growing a bit more straight, and I've actually been chopping it. Let me see if I can go lower. There you go. That's where the top of that is, and I've chopped it. And again, you might be able to see if I bring it in a bit closer. This is such an awkward angle for me, but you might be able to see the peduncle there, which is obviously why I cut. So I kept the peduncle. There are they were. Yeah, there's another couple of peduncles on that one plant. There is a very empty vine on this one, but you might be able to see, if I bring it in a bit closer, the sheer volume of peduncles that are happening around that kind of barren vine, which is kind of why I'm keeping it on there. It doesn't look great, but when these are in bloom, it 
you cannot tell that there's not any leaves in there because the peduncles are so huge. Uh, I think normally during the summertime when this blooms, on average, my old one, I'll probably get about 20 to 30 peduncles. So that's quite substantial. But right, let me put one of these down. I might put, mm, I might put the youngest one down. And just before I do that, this plant is probably about two years old at the moment. This I was given as a gift uh, by somebody that didn't know that I had already had this plant. But obviously, I'm not going to say no to a Hoya. Come on. But let me put this down and just hold the one because it's heavy. Right, that's a bit better. Now I can actually talk a bit easier about this plant. And actually, before I dive into that, obviously, as this is the background section over the plant, I will put a picture of what it looked like when I first got it from my plant care app. I don't, if I have both plants as separate pictures, I might add both of them here. But you can see what it looked like when I first got it. It was a relatively established plant, to be fair. And for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you can see it's a very, very small pot for the sheer volume of the size. And I don't know whether or not it might pick it up. Yeah, there you go. You can see uh, I had a little donation from uh, one of the sedums, and I'll add the sedum here. I can't remember exactly which one this was. And it's also growing in there, but I'm not, you know what? Live your life. Do what you need to do, it's fine. You, you can be a companion plant to the Hoya. It's absolutely fine. But yes, yeah, the story behind how I got this plant in my care, and I will preface this and say that I know that at least in the UK and Europe, these have become a lot more available than what they used to be when I first got them. The other thing, obviously, <laughs> the elephant in the room, is that a lot of people probably seen these plants as a single leaf stuck in some soil with a tiny bit of that petiole, which is the section that attaches the leaf to the stem. And people buy it and it's like, it's, I think that is also called the sweetheart hoya or the sweetheart plant. It depends on how you find it. There's, there's an obscene amount of things that people do to those single leaf cuttings to make them more attractive, usually around Valentine's Day, ranging from glitter to carvings to markings on it. I'm just saying, can you, can we all just leave plants to be the way that they are because they are pretty? in themselves, they don't need the paraphernalia. But uh, the, the thing is, when I got this, you could find, you could, I mean, still to this day, you can find the single leaf cuttings, which, <laughs> spoiler alert, nine times out of 10, that will only and forever be a leaf with roots, because it will root out and it will survive for however long it's gonna survive, but it will very, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get a vine from it. You can, and people always say this, I have not had this experience from anybody that I know that got those, including myself, way back in the day when I bought one as a single leaf. If you're very lucky and when they were cutting it, they cut off some of the stem, that might activate and you might get some vineage happening. But for the majority of people, that really just won't happen. If you have comfortable still looking at that one singular leaf, you do you. But I kind of wanted a vine of this, and it, it was quite difficult to find. I think I got mine from the Ginger Jungle way back when. I do think I have got a link down below for the Ginger Jungle. Anybody that's kind of been collecting for a while in terms of the UK, they probably have heard of the Ginger Jungle. Amazing company and amazing in terms of shipping. But this plant came to me. It was in great condition. I finally got it. I was looking for it for a long time, um, and I saw it come up and I managed to grab one from the ginger jungle. So I was over the moon and it has really grown quite nicely and not really skipped much of a beat. You can see some of the original leaves. I think that these, that might've actually been one of the original leaves. These probably were, but you can see I've had some reversion. I've had some of these leaves are curving back on themselves as well. I tend to leave them. People that have been here for a while will know that I will generally let my plants do what my plants want to do. I'm not that fussed about not this not reverting fully to green. I have got a green one as well. I like both forms. There's quite a few variegated leaves on there. And to be fair, and this is the thing that most people tend to forget, with most variegated plants, yes, they can push out a whole bunch of green, 
You could, unless it gets absolutely huge and 80% of it is green, you could always at any given point chop back the green to a, a variegated leaf. This one's got way too much variegation, but you can see unlike a lot of the other aroids, because the leaves are so much more succulent, and these leaves are very, very, very thick, even by Hoyer standards. So this one won't crisp up. There's a tiny bit of crisping, there's a tiny bit of browning that you can get with some of these more variegated leaves, but it doesn't seem to harm the plant in any way or form. You can also see, um, see if I can bring it in and you can see that leaf there. And again, I'll see if I can insert clips in different areas. There's a bit of ruching that's happening on this. This is definitely a plant that I just kind of let dry out fully and then water it when I'm ready, basically. But yeah, I think that's the bit of the background on this one. I've probably prattled along for this background section more so than any other video. So let's move on to the next topic. So looking at speed of growth, <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, this is still a Hoya. It's still going to be a relatively slow growing plant. Obviously for the eagle eyed amongst you, you can see that I've just changed sides for this plant and give my this hand a rest because again, it's heavy. Um, but it's going to be slow. In terms of propagating, as long as you get a stem cutting in there, and I've had success with damp sphagnum moss. Perlite definitely did really well. Pond did really well. Soil did really well with this one. It just needs to be a very, very light and airy mix. But yeah, I mean, with the speed, yeah, it's going to be a Hoya. So again, I'll benchmark it against my golden pothos. So if the golden pothos will get two to three leaves in the summer per month, this one might get one. And to be fair, comparatively to some of the other slightly faster growing Hoyas, this is one of the slower ones. I will quickly kind of follow that up and say both of my plants are probably in very, very tight pots at the moment. I mean, let me see if I can tilt this. And again, hopefully I'll be able to get some closer video shots. You can see that the roots are quite dense in there. So yes, probably I could, this could do with a repot. I don't worry too much with my Hoyas and t unless I start seeing them really struggling. And also with this one, I kind of don't want it to get any bigger. This does irritate me to no end, but I do keep it on there for the peduncles. Uh, I'm trying to decide whether or not at any point I'm gonna cut that off, probably not. But yeah, I mean, lessons learned. And you can see from the other one that I was showing before, which is more of an upright, I've kind of learnt my lesson and I've kept that upright and just chop it back and hopefully it will activate further down. And you can see an activation point there. This had a couple of leaves, but now it's more of a node and it's growing kind of its own little branch. And I'm trying to see, you might be able to see right there in the inside, there's a new leaf that's gonna be coming in. And this has done it quite readily with this plant generally. So, and you can see some of the adventitious roots right there. So a really interesting one. I would also imagine that this might be one that if it's given a bit of a tree, because it does get those roots along the stem as well, not just the node, that this might actually attach and kind of climb up. Um, not necessarily like a shingler, but close enough. But yeah, in terms of speed of growth, slow as an average house plant, slow-ish for a Hoyer. Let's move into ease of propagation. I did kind of touch on this previously. This one was an interesting one. Yeah, I've pretty much tried it in every propagation method except for water, I think. I don't think I've tried this in water. If you've tried this in water and you've had good success, or even if you haven't had good success, let us know down below. But yeah, damp sphagnum moss did really well. Perlite did really well, as I was saying. Pond did really well. Soil did really well. It, didn't need an awful lot. And I will actually say that with all of those, I did not put it in a high humidity environment. I did not put it in my kind of propagation box. I just had it out in the open in regular household humidity. And it did. Well, it rooted. It took its time. It is going to be a Hoya, and the amount of times I'm going to say that throughout this video. 
it is a Hoya, so it will take its time to root out, but it does eventually start going. And to be fair, I think after, I think the question that most people might have with this one is, at what point can I expect a bit more of a fuller plant? And I would say probably around the year and a half to two year mark, at least that has been my experience. I know that might differ for some people, but again, let us know down below. But yeah, this is this is a plant that will propagate relatively easily. So um, I'm trying to think what else might be of interest here when we're looking at the propagation side of things. Yeah, the nodes are quite clear on this plant. You can usually tell quite easily where the nodes are and because of the advantageous roots. And I will say this, these advantageous roots, this specific Hoya does not grow in my conservatory. Regardless of what I said in the beginning, most of my plants are in the conservatory. This is growing in a room, in my house, above a radiator. The thing I will say, and I will talk about this more in the accessories and care section, is this gets treated, all of the Hoya carry eyes that I have, get treated exactly like I would with a cactus or a succulent. So it's getting the brightest light that I can possibly give it right up against a window. And these seem to be loving life. Yes, you could probably say that some of these leaves that are further back are a bit darker, some of these leaves that are closer to the light, and I know some of these have got variegation that are a bit lighter, so they might get, they might look a bit washed out. But I don't mind, the, the plant is happy. Uh -huh. um, the one thing I will say about this Hoya specifically, both the green one and the variegated one, as far as I can remember, this doesn't get sun stressed. Some, some Hoyas will get sun stressed and have more silver or more reddy colors. This one doesn't, it kind of stays as it is. And if anything, the green does just get a bit paler, basically. Let's flip it around. I've got the younger version of the same plant now to show you. But um, in terms of availability for this one, as I mentioned, it, it, it has become, at least from what I can tell, a lot more available in most places. I've seen this in plant stores, I've seen this in garden centers. Granted, it doesn't crop up as often as you might see like a pothos or a Monstera deliciosa, for instance, but you do see these come up a lot more. I'd be really interested in your area of the world, is that the same case, basically? Because I would assume it probably is. There is still, probably if I was to say, do I see more of this, so the full vines, or do I see more of the single leaf cuttings? It's more of the single leaf cuttings and it's usually around Valentine's Day, shocking. But yeah, this is becoming a bit more readily available. I got it, and again, <laughs> this is where I laugh, like some of my previous videos where I'm just like, I thought I was paying a lot of money for it. It was around the mid double digits point, I think back then. I'm pretty sure you can get it for a lot less than that at the moment. I don't know if it ever got, maybe, I, I think maybe I got it before everybody wanted it. So I got it at an okay price. I don't know, I, I have a very sneaky suspicion that back when this plant probably was getting close to the triple digits, I don't think it ever did get to the triple digits, but I might be wrong, correct me. But yeah, at the moment, a lot more available. You can see it in a lot more places. I think that is a good thing with this one because it is one that at least in my experience has been a slightly easier and less fussy Hoya to grow. So this is a good thing that they're a lot more available. I think you still get the single leaf cuttings or the single leaf rooted cuttings on places like eBay and stuff like that, but probably not as much. So the price has gone down, whether or not the interest has gone down is an, in, is an interesting one at the moment because I have still got these in my collection. I have got a sentimental attachment to them, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not something that hugely excites me anymore as a plant. But we'll talk a bit more about that at the very end and on my final thoughts. But yeah, in terms of availability, a lot more available these days. Moving on to pests with this one, and I'm trying to see if I can find a pest to show you. This one, 
specifically had got treated a couple of weeks ago. Oh no, there is a pest that I can show you. Can you see the little white fluff there? <laughs> oh, the people that have been here for a while will know that mealybugs. But generally I will say not through any of my experiences within the conservatory alone, but Hoyas generally more so than any other pests, I find that mealybugs will always gravitate towards them. I have a very sneaky suspicion, I did mention this on a previous video, we don't get an awful lot of scale, at least I've never really experienced it in the UK, I know the US sometimes do. I have a sneaky suspicion that scale might be a problem for it. I would imagine if mealybugs are attracted to it, scale probably would be as well, but do let me know down below. But yeah, mainly mealybugs with this one. Has it occasionally had thrips? Yes, I'm trying to see if there's any thrip damage on this that I can show you. Kind of? And I think that might be thrip damage, I'm not entirely sure. Let me see, and if not I'll see if I can add a, a clip. You might be able to see some of the, the bumping on there. That might also be edema with this plant, so not 100% sure, but yes, I, I have seen thrips on this. Were they particularly happy and did they stick around for a long time? Probably not. So that is a good thing, because I think most people when they hear thrips, we all start cringing slightly. <laughs> but uh, spider mites, again, not really an issue, at least my experience with this one. It is predominantly going to be spider mites, not spider mites, oh, mealybugs. That's the word. Um, and even with my experiences with whitefly, I will say that most whitefly, in my experience at least, haven't really gone to this. So predominantly mealybugs. So coming on to care and kind of accessories for this. <laughs> Obviously support sticks, plant ties will be very very useful with this one. And I would say, and you might be able to see here I've got these kind of velcro plant ties. I do also use the other twisty ties. I will say something like a velcro tie would be quite good because I don't know whether or not you might be able to see there that velcro is coming undone. And you can see that vine is actually thicker than the support stick at the moment, but then if I bring it right back down, you can see that that vine isn't as thick. So when they come in, the vines are a bit thinner, but as it matures, especially if you've attached it to something, it will get thicker. So you want something like a Velcro that will eventually give. So it's better to, rather than kind of muzzle the, the, the plant stem in a sense and potentially kill off any growth further up because you're kind of restricting it. And I've seen, I'm trying to see whether or not, <laughs> for the people that have been here for a while, <laughs> the ceiling fan is all that's why I keep looking up because this is a very tall plant and I can see what's about to happen. But um, you might be able to see some of that bumping that's happening there. I don't know whether or not this one had it possibly there, and I don't know whether or not it's going to come up, mm, probably not as well. I'll see if I can add a clip on there. There, there it did have the metallic twisty ties and it kind of pinched the plant and there's a permanent bump on there and I'm glad I caught it before it caused more damage. So yes, velcro plant ties would be good on this because it gives it that opportunity to bust out of it and you can always go back in and give it a larger piece and kind of reattach it on there. There is going to be a point obviously where it won't get much much thicker, but I don't think even I've got to that stage because at the very very bottom it is very very thick. So that's the one thing I will say. In terms of care, and this is interesting, that's why I wanted both of these plants to show you. This one is in pond and I always have a water reservoir underneath it. The other plant that I was showing just a moment ago is in terracotta in my arrowed soil mix. And interestingly, this is before I kind of knew and was removing it, that has still got the quote unquote collar of death on it. So it's got that um, cocoa coir kind of plug that you get a lot of the Hoyas kind of grown in before they're sold out. What I have done with that one is a lot of the times those plugs come with a string that's keeping it together. I, if I remember correctly, I did remove that string and actually looking at it in the pot now, that initial coir kind of plug 
has kind of expanded and opened up. So it's not causing as much of a restriction as you would imagine, and it hasn't really caused any issues. But yeah, I thought people might find that interesting that that has still got that on it, and it's as old as it is, and it's not got any real issues. <laughs> it might also be why it's as small as it is, but I think that's more to do with the size of the pot that I've got it in, because with a lot of Hoyas, people are like, keep it root bound, it likes being in the same pot for the next 30 years, yeah, it probably won't mind it too, too much. But if you give it a bigger pot, it will become a bigger plant. I don't want that to be a bigger plant, so I'm not giving it a bigger pot. I will say, and this is just anecdotally from my experience, my Hoyas that are in slightly more confined spaces tend to bloom sooner. And I will say here that it's still a Hoya, it will still take a while for it to get its first few peduncles and bloom. But, and this is just what I've kind of experienced, I can't say this kind of concretely. If I've got it in a slightly smaller pot, if it would have taken a year in a larger pot or two years to bloom in a smaller pot, it might take a bit less time for those initial blooms to come in. Does it also mean that it blooms a bit more? Possibly, because actually most of my Hoyas are in very, very tight pots and have been there for a few years. They bloom prolifically. So that's the one thing I would say. In terms of the other kind of tips and tricks that people have tried, there was a large, long period, there was a point a while ago where people were saying get the orchid fertilizer spray mist thing and spray them and it will really help them. I tried that. I feel like I wasted my money, didn't do very much, I don't think. Uh, you might have had different experiences. If you have, do let us know down below. I think everybody was going for the spray bottle that was pink. I can't, I would like to say Miracle Grow, it might not be. But I couldn't find that one and I found another spray orchid mist fertilizer and it might have been that. Maybe people have had better luck with that pink bottle. I don't know. But that didn't work that great for me. Liquid gold leaf, as with most of my other plants, has done really, really well with this. And the one thing that I think I've heard a lot of people say, and I will echo that, is they're very similar to, most of my Hoyas are very similar to orchids where you feed them weekly, weekly kind of a thing. You probably wouldn't be necessarily watering a Hoya every week, but for every watering, you would have a very weak solution of fertilizer in it, even in the winter, and I find that they really, really do appreciate it. Because you also need to remember with Hoyas, there might not be a lot of movement or a lot of activity that happens. They kind of almost look like they might be dormant, not all of them, some of them, in the winter time, but they kind of need to store up some of that energy and some of those nutrients for when spring comes around so they can really push out those blooms. At least that's the way that it works in my head. Whether or not that's entirely accurate, I don't know. But that's the way that I like to think about it. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say for care and accessories for this. It's not a particularly difficult plant to kind of manage, really, if that makes sense. So arrowed mix will work well, pond works well, plastic pot would work well. You probably need to water a bit less. I've had this in net pots, it did okay, I had it in terracotta pots. Terracotta tends to be my groove, or pond or terracotta for most of my Hoyas. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say for this section, let's move on. So coming into final thoughts, and I finally put both plants down, because... ow. <laughs> The thing that I will say about this, and I think you might have got a bit of a taste from it previously, I'll do the usual thing that I always do, is knowing what I know now, if I didn't have this plant, would I purchase this plant? Probably not. And there are good reasons, and they're more personal reasons to me. It's not necessarily that it's a big bad plant. I would actually almost say, if you are first starting off with a Hoya, and you want something that isn't just a Carnosa, this is a good one to go for, at least in my experience, I found that it's not that temperamental. It also will teach you patience in the beginning, more so than most other Hoyas. So it is good in that respect. The reason why I probably wouldn't get it isn't for anything to do with care or anything like that. It's two things specifically. One, 
it doesn't excite me. And to be fair with this plant, it stopped exciting me quite quickly after I got it. I do love them now because I've there's kind of a backstory for my personal plants in my collection. They've been around for so long that and that's why even when I got gifted one, I didn't then end up giving it to somebody else saying, I've already got it in my collection, I don't need it. And I didn't need a green one either, but I have all three of these plants now. And I'm quite happy to have all three of these plants. My green one might be on its way out. Am I sad about that? Probably not. Uh, will I maybe try to salvage a node if it does kind of turn to mush? Probably, and see what happens, just because then I can say I've still got a green one. I need to stop doing that. I need to stop. <laughs> If a plant is on its way out and it's not giving me any joy, I need to either let it go or gift it to somebody who would be happy to have that plant and maybe might want to rehab it if it's struggling. I need to get that into my head. <laughs> I say that to myself enough, it might actually happen. But uh, yeah, with this one, I would say that's one of the big reasons is I'm not kind of in love with it anymore. The other one is the blooms. And I do always say I'm probably going to chop off the blooms. I never quite grasp how some people would just put the blooms in plastic bags. I'm just like, that's kind of a waste. You've been waiting for that bloom for a long time. <laughs> this one I found doesn't really have much of a scent for me, even when I smell it at night. And if it does have a bit of a scent, it's kind of almost... <sighs> Trying to think because it sits right next to my herbavata and I don't and they both bloom at almost exactly the same time. So when I try to smell both of them, I think it's the herbavata that's a bit more, you need to get really close in to smell it. And it's a very kind of I don't know how better to describe it than condensed floral smell. And it's a bit cloying at times. So I don't think it's this one. I think this one is scentless for me. The problem with this one, and I do get it with some of my other Hoyas, is that they drip from the from the blooms. A lot of my other Hoyas will drip and it's like a sugary substance and it will kind of stick to everything beneath it. This one won't drip. It will stay as a globule of liquid on the actual bloom itself and it's kind of red and it looks a bit, it looks like it could be blood basically. Um, but that one, if you ever accidentally graze it, it will stick to you and it's almost that kind of consistency and the stickiness of kind of treacle. So it's, it's not less than ideal and it will also stain everything around it. Eventually that drop might actually drop as well. So, but it's very congealy and dense basically. And it's not just the variegated ones, it's also the green one. For that reason alone, it'd probably be a no for me in the future. You're probably asking yourself now, I'm keeping the peduncles on my on my older one, why would I want to keep them on there? I still enjoy the look of the blooms. So, yeah. Um, but coming into kind of my final, final score from zero being the worst, zero one being the worst, to ten being the best, where would I benchmark this as a plant? And I'll give it two scores. For kind of ease and kind of starting off for kind of people in the beginning, I would probably give this a solid like seven. For having it as a house plant because of the issue that you might lose interest like I did or those blooms with that syrupy situation there I would probably give this a five or a four for appearance maybe a bit more I don't want to give this too many scores if that makes sense I want to kind of stick to it and four and a five I'd say with this one um but yeah this might be an interesting video that a lot of people might disagree with me for whatever reason. Please do let me know. But yeah, that has been my experience with the Hoya Kerii in multiple formats, both variegated and green. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.